Well, when I was about 16, 17 years old, my cousin had met this girl out of another city. And you know, the girl came around, we didn't know who she was, you know what I mean? We did a little investigation on her to check her out, but we couldn't figure out who she was. Well, we, well, we found out in the long run that she was the type of girl that came married dudes, got into hood, and set guys up. Well, what happened was, I was the one she wanted to set up. I guess wherever she came from, they were speaking my name and volumes out there because I was putting in a lot of work. I was shooting a lot of people, you know what I mean? Sticking a lot of people, beating up a lot of people, and they wanted my ass. So I guess they got at this girl and they wanted her to set me up. So this is the way the scenario went. I'm in the hood one day kicking it, and uh, one of my homies tells me, hey man, I get to the hood, you know, and every time we get to the hood, we tell the homie, hey, there's a 38 in the bush, there's a nine millimeter in the mailbox. You know, we let him know wherever the gun was at. So I get there, he tells me, hey, there's a 38 inside the bushes. Okay, when he tells me this, it's me, my homie, a girl, and another dude, and my old lady. He tells me, hey, there's a 38 in the bushes, if you need it, it's right there. So we're kicking it, boom, about 15 minutes pass. Some dudes pass by, boom, and the way we do it is, if somebody passes by and they're looking, we let them go. If they make a U-turn and they pass by again, we can be shot at. So what happened was, here comes a car. Who comes by, they're looking, they're looking. Boom, turns around, makes a U-turn. Boom, I run out to the street, grab the gun. Boom, 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 shoot the car up. Must have unloaded the whole, yeah, it was a real over, so I unloaded all the rounds on it. Shot the car up, it went, it had flat tires, everything, it left. Well, about 15 minutes later, here comes another car. Here comes the car. This car don't pass it, it stops. So I walk up to the car and I look, Lo and behold, it's the girl. She's inside the car. Now, previous to this, she had told on my cousin and he had went away for seven years. She testified against him. So my thing was, okay, I need to get rid of this bitch for the simple fact that she knows too much. She's been around the hood so long that she knows everybody not by name. She knows we're half of us sleep when we lay our heads at night. So my thing is, we need to get rid of this bitch. So what happened was she drove up I walked up, I seen her in the car, I went back, grabbed the 38, put it in my waistband, went back to her car, and she has like an 82 or 84 uh, cutlass. It's either a regal or a cutlass, I remember it was light blue. So I walk up to the door and I tell her, hey, what's up? Well, I'm not knowing at the same time she's coming to pick me up because she's gonna take me to Pico Rivera, to our main enemies, she's gonna set me up over there. There's like 15, 20 dudes waiting for me over there. I don't know this, I find this out after. What happens is I get in the car, she opens, she opens the door, picks up the seat, I get in the back. When I get in the back seat, someone else jumps in with me. Now this guy that jumps in with me is my homeboy, but I know that he's not capable of doing what's gonna take place right now. And what what's gonna take place right now, he is not capable of it. In other words, he can't hold his water. He don't got enough balls to do what's gonna take place. So as we're in the back seat, I tell him, Get the fuck out, get out. And he's like, no, oh, I wanna go with you, I wanna go with you. I said, no, get out. He's like, no, I wanna go with you. Now in my head I'm saying, this dude can't go with me because he can't handle what's gonna take place right now. Well, he don't wanna leave the back seat. We're arguing in the back seat. Finally I tell him, look, cause there's two people, she's driving, there's another person with her. I don't know this person, but this person gotta go as well. I'm gang banging, I'm in the thick of things right now. I'm getting, they're trying to, they're hunting me down. You know, fools are looking at me from other hoods. I'm shooting every weekend at them. They're shooting every weekend at me. So I'm thinking this dude don't have the balls to go with me. So one thing leads to another. I can't make too much of a commotion in the back seat because she can see me, she's listening to us. So I show him the gun, I tell him, get the fuck out. No, no, no. I said, all right, you wanna go? Let's go. I tell her, come on, let's go. So she starts driving. By that time, I take the gun out. They say in court transcripts, I already got convicted. They say I get the gun and I put it to the base of her skull. So everybody here put the gun to the base of her skull. Now as we're driving, I'm telling her, turn left. What the bitch does, she turns right. I tell her, stop, the bitch keeps going. So I have her, she don't wanna listen, so I end up pistol whipping her one time. Oh, I don't break her head, but I give her a pretty good knock because I hit her with the butt of the gun. Boom, now she's paying attention, she's listening. But at this time, my homie that's sitting next to me, I turned to look at him, he's really nervous, really pale. And I told him, I fucking told you get out the fucking car. So now in my mind, I'm thinking, if I do her and I do her, I have to do him. Because 
he is not capable of holding his fucking water. So what happens is we're going, we're driving. What happens is I say, well, I got to get him in a dark, secluded area. So what I do is on the corner of Telegraph and Pioneer Boulevard, there's a bar that they call the Rim Ramp. Now behind the Rim Ramp, it's really, really dark. There's a couple of dumpsters back there. There's an alley. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take her and I'm going to put, I'm going to put him over here and I'm going to handle him. What happens is she pulls over in back of that place. It's really, really dark. I get both of the people out of the car. And this is in transcripts what it said that I put them both on their knees, execution style. What happens is what my homie testifies in court, what my homie testifies and puts on paper is that I got them both out of the car. I turned around and I looked at my homie and I said, I'm gonna smoke this bitch first. This is what's said in transcripts. Now, once I said, I'm gonna smoke this bitch first, and I turn around and put the gun back on the broad, as soon as I'm gonna handle my business, my homie jumps on my back. Now remember, he went with me. He's my homeboy, but he got so scared of what's taking place right now, he want no part of it, that he jumps on my back. When he jumps on my back, we start to struggle. The gun leaves my hand and goes sliding across the floor. Now at this moment, this woman's screaming at the top of her lungs for the police. By this time, I hear sirens coming. I hear sirens coming. So what I do is I get the gun, I cut around the front, and as I'm coming out the front, I see a highway patrolman sitting at the gas station. He has one of those explorers with him, the ones that wear the yellow shirts and go with them and they take them around and they show them, you know, the ropes and shit. And my thing is, he's coming. By that time, the cop is the siren, he hears the commotion. The, 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 uh, the, what do they call him, the little uh, ride along guy, what he does is he runs around the back of the car and he, I see him hit the trunk real hard to get the highway patrol's attention. But at the same time, he's gonna run across the street. While I'm already behind a car, I got my gun and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna let this fool have it. You're not gonna catch me, I just did this. I know she's gonna tell me, fuck it, I might as well go out in a bang. So what happens is I put my gun over the car and I aim. Now, this guy's coming across a main street. My thing is, once he crosses halfway that main street and he takes one step off that curb, I'm gonna send his ass back across the street. Well, lo and behold, I pull it out, I take my aim, here he comes. I think what happened was he seen the shininess of the gun because when he looked in my direction, if he would have took one more step off that curb, I would have sent his ass to kingdom come. But what happens was he stopped. He never took a step off the curb. He turned around and ran back the opposite way. So that gave me time to escape. So I'm running. I hear sirens, I see the bird, hear the bird coming, that's the helicopter, I'm like shit. So I'm running down an alley, I see a set of headlights, and I, I know the difference between a cop's headlights and a regular car's headlights. So I see it's a cop. Well, what I do is I jump over one wall, and I was thinking, how can I stash this gun? What's the best way I can stash this gun? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm looking, there's buckets and all kinds of shit, I'm like, nah, they're gonna search right here. Well, I look to the side and I see there's a tree in a backyard and it's a pretty big tree. So what I do is I climb up the tree, I break a branch and I hang the gun by the barrel, by the barrel of the trigger guard. I hang it by the trigger guard. So in other words, it's by the trigger guard just swinging on a branch, pretty thick branch. So I stuck it up there, boom. I jump back down, boom. I take off running again. I hear another cop coming up the alley towards me. What I do is I get under this motorcycle. Now this motorcycle has a blue tarp on it. But when I went to get under the motorcycle, I end up hitting my leg on one of the pegs that stick out the side where they put their feet when they ride it. I hit a peg and I split my damn leg open. So at this time, I'm already out of breath. I'm holding my leg, I'm trying to wrap it with the headband that I have, but it's bleeding profusely. It's bleeding a lot because I cut it on that big old spike. Well, I don't know what to do, so I go and I get a water hose, and I, I'm waiting my leg down, waiting my leg down. All of a sudden, I hear another car coming up the alley. I know they're cops because they make a whistling noise with their motor, and when they put their brakes, for some reason, they're always squeaking. Their brakes are always squeaking. So now I'm like, man, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna get away from this? So I wait, I wait, I wait. Here comes another car. 
As soon as he passes me, I shoot across the street. Now I'm running down the street. Down the street from a distance, I see another. There's so many cops around. There's so many cops around. Every, every, first, every second car is a cop. Here comes another cop. What I do is I dive and I get into a little flower bed. It's a little brick flower bed. And I remember I'm laying in the flower bed. I'm trying to catch my breath and I see the light just going over me back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, oh man, I could just imagine what these cops want to do to me due to the fact that all these cops know me by name. I know the bride gave up my first name. She was married to my cousin, so she knew exactly where I lived. She knew my name, what they called me. So, and I knew that previously these cops were passing word around that they wanted to kill me. This was coming out of the normal sheriff that they wanted to kill me. This was the detectives for other shit that was being done and they were blaming me. And I'm not saying I did it all or I didn't do it all. Yes, I took part in some of it, but I know they want to get me, so I'm really worried about when they catch me, what do I do? Do I raise my hands up? Do I pick my shirt up? What do I do? Take my shirt off now so they see don't have a gun because I know they're going to be looking for someone who's armed and dangerous because the simple fact that the girl must have told them that I had a gun. So I go to my homie's house. I'm hiding behind his garage. A cop passes. Another cop passes. They're all shining their lights. I mean, within a, maybe a 10 to 15 second window, I see my girlfriend coming with her mother and they're going real slow through the hood. I get up to a bush, I wait, as soon as they pass, I run and I dive inside the back seat. Boom, as soon as I get in the back seat, I tell my mom, I'll go, go, go. So we leave. I end up getting away. But what happens is she knows all of my information, so they start raiding all my family's houses. They're raiding all their houses. They're walking around with a flyer that has my picture on it and says, known gang member, says my name, what they call me, and then bottom print and says, uh, attention, known to be armed and dangerous. So they went around showing these flyers to all my homies, to my family, my grandmother gets one, she shows me the copy and I'm like, whoa, these, they're looking for me that bad? Well, I'm not knowing that they already stuck all kinds of other shit on me. So what they stuck on me was they, get, they want to get me for two murders, like four counts of kidnap. Uh, and in juvenile, I have loading, uh, holding a con concealed weapon and discharging a firearm within an inhabited dwelling. So I had this in juvenile. I got this in the adult now. So I'm on the run. I'm on the run for maybe, oh shit. I was on the run for maybe 18 months. And I went to Arizona. I went to San Luis Obispo. I went to San Francisco. Uh, Oakland, I went back to Arizona, and it was weird because everywhere I was at, as soon as I felt uncomfortable, I would leave. A day or two later, they would hit the house. They went all the way to Arizona to find me. They went all the way to San Luis Obispo to find me, and they were right on my tail. I mean, they were right on my tail so close that, like I said, every time I left, one or two days later, they would hit the house. And I'd be like, oh man, shit. You know what I mean? They're, they're on me so intently that I'm also finding out information from the sheriff's station because we have a few girls that actually work there as those explorers and they work inside. So they give us vital information about what's going on. We went to school with these girls, we're older now, they're getting jobs. So they work inside there. So we're getting vital information. Lo and behold, I find out that the Norwalk sheriffs have their own Norwalk Sheriff's 10 most wanted. I'm number three, I'm number three. The reason I'm number three is because the two guys in front of me, they've been wanted longer and they have packed more, uh, how could we say, more bullshit on top of them. They've charged them more, they're, they're getting more charges. So <clears throat> I know I'm number three on the Sheriff's 10 most wanted. I know they're passing a flyer around me, armed and dangerous, and with a 38. Mine had just, they put the caliber of the gun. So I'm thinking in my head, man, when they catch me, they're gonna kill me. When they catch me, they're gonna kill me. Well, within these 18 months, you can imagine, I ran from them so many times. I got so many times close to getting caught. I always got away. I was running a month. I had a gun 24 seven in my waistband. I didn't leave without a gun. Now I'm walking around in a slingshot with a gun in my waist. I'm living in some apartments that I already sold up. 
I have a manager even dealing dope. So I have whole apartments filled up. I got any room I want. There's empty rooms that people leave, leave all their furniture. I just take over the room. I'm supplying the manager with dope. So I'm like the real manager. So we're living there, you know, we're not, and I'm knowing that eventually the Noah shares are gonna find where I'm at. They're gonna just hunt me down eventually, do their job and they're gonna find me. Well, I'm on the run and I'm really getting tired of running. I'm getting tired of running for the simple fact that I cannot lay anywhere comfortable at night. I can't trust anybody. I mean, I gotta be careful where I'm at because if there's a lot of people there and someone calls the cops, they're gonna come and run and make and I'm gone. They're gonna know who I am once they get me. They're gonna identify me by my tattoos. Had my teardrop on my face since I was 15. You know, I'm 17 now, I'm gonna be 18. So they got, they're real familiar with who I am. But like I said, I'm running around everywhere. Um, I'm having people drive me here, drive me there. I've, I went inside the trunk. I've let people sit on top of me in the back seat. You know, so many different things because I'm on the run and so intently. And right now as it stands, I'm fighting. I'm going to fight some life sentences because there's kidnaps, there's murders, you know, and they're just trying to place all kinds of shit on me. So what happens is one morning I get up and it's like a ritual. Every morning I get up and I check the traps that I have. What I actually did was I was living in a corner apartment on the bottom of a complex and I was in the corner. I had one window on, on, so we'll say on the south side of the building and another window on the east side of the building. Well, what I did was I got big old pieces of glass. I broke big old beer bottles of glass and I got the biggest shards of pieces. And what I did was I put them inside the ground next to my back window. What I did was I set them in different spots and then every spot I didn't have a piece of glass sticking out the ground so somebody would step on it and you know I would hear him because every where there wasn't a piece of glass I put an aluminum can so my mind was thinking if they came to my back window to get me they see the aluminum cans they're gonna avoid the aluminum can aluminum can and step in the area where there's not a can okay they're gonna step on the glass when they step on the glass or the nails that I put in the ground once they step on that and it penetrates their skin now they're gonna step everywhere and I'm gonna hear them step on the cans. I'm gonna know somebody's in the window and I'm gonna let them have it. I'm not gonna ask who's there or no. And once I hear those cans getting crushed, I'm gonna let it have it. Whoever's there is gonna, I'm gonna fucking pump them full of lead. This is my mentality because in fact, I'm on the run for some serious crimes. And you can imagine what I did from when I was on the run. I didn't care anymore, you know what I mean? I was going every week into everybody's hood and I would hit them four or five times in one day, four or five times in one day. Just hit them four or five times, each of them. Because of the simple fact that I was the only one out there really, really active in my hood. So that morning I wake up, I do my little ritual, I check my traps, both sides of my window, everything's cool. You know what I mean? Uh, I get Miguel in my, in my room, I got a couple cameras set up outside, I check, you know, parking lot, check the driveway, you know what I mean? And everything's cool. Well, I got, Luckily, I grab my gun, I take it to my homie's apartment a few doors down, and we smoke a little bit of dope, we get high, we're talking about what we're gonna do today, and I tell him, you know what, um, I'll be back, man. I'm gonna go to my house real quick, you know, I'll be right back, you know, and uh, he's like, all right, go ahead, man. So I get my gun, I stash it under his bed. I go to the house. Uh, my girlfriend's there, I have a newborn baby, maybe about three months old. She has the baby right there and we're kicking back, we're talking, all of a sudden I hear boom, boom, boom. At the same time I hear cans start to get crunched. So my first thing is, but I ain't got my gun. I left my gun at my homie's house. I come out the front door because when I looked out the people, there must have been 15 fucking cops lined up, ready to come in the door. I threw my people, I see just all kinds of faces and all kinds of guns, and I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I go to the back window to look out, I ain't going nowhere. They got dudes posted up on both sides with fucking shotguns, ready for me to come out the back window. So I'm thinking, damn, what the fuck am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I couldn't do shit. I'm gonna fake like I'm asleep. So fuck it, I lay down. Boom, they kick in the door, they charge in, grab everybody, put everybody on the floor. Now mind you, I'm giving them a fake name. I have no ID, I don't carry ID, so I'm giving them a fake name. I think I gave them something like Joe Chavez or something. They run the name. 
the name come back clean. I can't believe it. I'm about to get away. The name came back clean. I just gave him any name, any birthday. He came back clean. But about 10 minutes later, I see a fucking car pull up and I see a detective get off the car. This detective knows me by face. As soon as he comes up and sees me, we got him, we got him, huh? They all look at me. Oh, man. They must have beat my ass for like about five minutes. They were kicking me, hitting me with the fucking flashlights they had. One had his fucking foot on my neck. The other one was taking shots at my ribs. He bruised my ribs for like three months. They spit my lip, busted my eye, messed up all my neck. He stepped on my neck so hard that he actually pushed my Adam's apple so far back that uh, my, my throat was hurting for like about three months. Well, they ended up figuring out who I am. I am giving my real name to take me to the station. Now they're telling me all my charges are down. Getting charged with. Most of them is bullshit. A couple of them, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they got their evidence, they, they got their child, they got their people who are telling, they got their snitches, their reliable informants. So I'm debating, you know, how much time I'm gonna take. So at that time I hit the county jail, and at this time the county jail is still active as hell. Still got big homies on the line. Still got fags running everywhere, and I don't mean that bad by that, but still got homosexuals running everywhere. You know, the county's, the county's just a straight jungle. It's just out of hand. So I get there, and every time I'm there, you know, I'm having a ball, I'm having fun. I'm making pruno, I'm buying dope. You know, everywhere I go, I, I got a cheer. I get the keys to right there, so I'm in charge of everything. So everything that comes in and out has to pass my hands. Every, you know, every kite, every, every, uh, uh, money order that people buy dope with it comes past my hands. I log it in, put my log away, and send it wherever it got to go. Well, I'm in there fighting my case, and I'm, I'm thinking right now they're trying to give me 35 to life. That's where they're at, 35 to life. They don't want to go down, they don't want to move. I'm trying to tell them I'll take 20 years right now. 20 years. I even went to 25. I told them I'll take 25 years right now. Nope, nope. We ain't giving you nothing, we ain't giving you nothing. So we wait. We postpone trial, we postpone trial. What happens maybe about two weeks before, well, uh, no, two days before we pick the jury? The high patrolman that was at the scene of the crime and everything ended up getting into an accident on the freeway on the 605, catching the 90. Some lady ran and hit him or something on his bike and he was no longer with us. So we went to court. They tell us right there in court. The officer that did the arrest and all this passed away previously. So his, all they're gonna use is whatever he said in the beginning. Can't use anything after because he's gone here. Just what he wrote in the police report. And the police report was all fucked up. Now, I wanted to find a discrepancy in my case on where can I beat my kidnaps because my murders, are, they already dropped them. They got me on two counts of kidnap. And I'm thinking, damn, where's the discrepancy in my case, something where I can fight this? Lo and behold, I'm going through my transcript and they're saying that I'm being arrested and tried for two counts of kidnap. But if you remember, in the beginning of the story, I explained something and I said, when I supposedly put the gun to the base of her skull, I told her, turn left, she turned right. I told her, Keep going, she stopped. I told her, stop, she kept going. So when you really look at it, I was never ever in power of her. I never really took command and made her do things she didn't want to do. Everything I told her, she did the exact opposite. Now mind you, with supposed to be a 12 inch gun to the base of her skull, she wasn't obeying my commands. So at that point, I said, wait a minute, how are, they convict how are they trying to convict me of a kidnap when I never ever had actual control of this person? That drops it to attempted kidnap, maybe even false imprisonment, because I never was in command. I never actually, at one time, if I would have told her to turn right and she would have turned right, well, then I was in command. I had control, but due to the fact that she did not uh, obey my commands, I was never ever really in charge. So I went in court and I told my lawyer, which I had a paid lawyer, he charged me $12,000.
That's what he charged me to represent me. That was just to go in there. And I get him, and he's pretty good. He was out of Norwalk, but he wasn't too bright up here because I seen what he didn't see. Then when I brought it to his attention, he kind of got upset because he didn't see it, but I told him, well, I got the idea from you when you were telling me the other day about, you were explaining to me what about the case, and I drew it off of what you were telling me. And I came up with, hey, I was never in control, so how are they gonna get me for kidnaps? I never kidnap anybody because of the fact that I totally never had control. So we go in court, we present that, and all of a sudden they're talking about 15 years. And I'm thinking, wait, 15 years. I just got him down from 35 to life to 15 years. Fuck it, I'll take it. I said, I'll take it. I was 17 years old, I figured I'll get out when I'm 30. By that time, you know what I mean? Uh, my kids will be a little bit older, you know what I mean? Uh, I won't be so radical with my beliefs, you know, the way I believe. I, w I wouldn't be so devious, so cunning, so, 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 so mean at times, you know, so awful, very terrible. You know, it's very, very sick individual. And I figured I went to prison, I'll get a little bit of schooling, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll get some education, I'll get some, I'll find some new ways to commit some crimes, you know, because that's what jail is. You know, if you want to know how to do something, you just go to jail and ask it. Somebody will tell you exactly step by step how to do this. So I ended up taking the 15. We get to court. They gave me six years for one kidnap, six years for another kidnap. And then they want to give me the other three for the gun. What gun? There is no gun. They never found a gun. If you remember, in the beginning I said I climbed up a tree, I broke a branch, and I hit the gun by the trigger guard. You know that gun sat there for all the time I went to prison. Oh, I went to prison for six years. I sat for six years in prison. When I got out, I went back and got my gun. I went back and got my gun. Now, the reason I got my gun is because, you know, when I got out this time, I was lit this time. I was living the family life. You know what I mean? I had a job, I had a nice car, a nice apartment, you know, and a very beautiful wife, beautiful daughter, and the hood kept calling. They kept pulling me. Well, all my brothers, all my cousins, they're from my hood. And there's one of my cousins that he's like a brother to me. So I get a phone call at the house. My wife answers here, they want you. Boom, I pick it up, it's my little brother. He's like, hey, we need some heat, we need some heat. I'm like, wait a minute, you need some heat? What do you mean? I've been gone away for six years. You guys been out here, you guys don't have no heat? You guys want my shit? Nah, you ain't getting my shit. So they're calling, they're calling, finding my aunt calls. What the hell is going on here? These guys are digging up the whole backyard. You need to tell them where it's at. I'm like, I ain't telling them where shit's at, you know? Finally, she's calling so much. I get at my little brother and tell him, look, man, I'm gonna tell you exactly where it's at. Do you know that I told him exactly where it was at? They dug up the whole fucking backyard, but never touched that one spot I told them where the gun was at. I think I should have told them it was everywhere else and they would have dug on that one spot because they had to call me to go over there. So I go over there, get to my grandmother's backyard. They're all back there, sweaty, all dirty. And I look at the yard and there must've been at least 15 to 20 holes, big holes. And I'm like, my grandfather has his yard very nice. There's holes everywhere. I'm like, oh my God, these fucking dudes, man. I fucking gave them throw, throw, throw map how to find it. You know, I told him, come here, stupid motherfucker. I dig them up, I pull them out. I must have like seven guns in there. They've been sitting in there, you know, so. I pull out three of them, I give one to my uncle, one to my little brother, and one to my cousin. And I tell him, look, that's, those are four here. You walk around here and use those. You don't go to another hood and use them, no. That's not what these are for. These are for strictly for our hood. So when people come in, we let them have it and get them back out. Well, I gave one to my brother, one to my uncle. You know, my uncle lives in the middle of my hood. My uncle, I go to his house one day and ask him, hey, Where's the, the gun that I gave you? Oh, I got it. Okay, well, I need it. Let's see it. Do you know, this guy went and got a fucking power drill. And he fucking started undrilling screws from the wall in the garage. And I was like, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting the gun. What do you mean? You're getting the gun. You got the, you got the gun locked behind a wall, bolted in. How are you supposed to get to this? When you have to handle business or they come, 
Then I gotta just put time out and let you take all these screws out, get this out, and then let them have it? No. So I ended up taking it back from him, and I'm thinking, damn, I cannot drive from my hood to my house with a gun on me. I'm a third striker. What am I gonna do? So I'm looking at my truck, I'm looking at my truck. Boom, I see my big, I got a 1500 bass, uh, uh, big, two big old 15 mega bass speakers, and they're in a box. So what I do is I take the box apart, I get the gun and I tape the gun to the inside of the box. I put the speakers back on, put the speaker back, and I drive home. I never even took it out of the box. I left it in the box. I drive over, I got pulled over several times. They searched everything, never found that gun. That gun came in handy when I needed it. It was very nice, but what happens is I end up getting, went back to the time, I end up getting the, the they end up giving me 12 years. I'm thinking, man, 12 years. And when I get the time, you know, all the homies, they're talking about, you're gonna do every last day of it. You're gonna do all 12 years. So I'm kind of upset, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's my first one, like I said, I didn't put in much work, but um, one time I'm sitting up there in uh, East Max in the county jail, and I see these two individuals are getting escorted. And then three more individuals are coming. And then three more come, and they slide a kite to me. I grab the kite, get it, take care of business, put it away. You know what I mean? Because you got to hoop a hot ass kite. There's, you cannot walk around with a hot ass kite in the county jail. You get caught in the county jail with a hot ass kite, you get your ass smashed. And you owe $200 fine. And no. You know, you get caught with one of those, you owe $200 by three days. If you can't handle those $300, it doubles to $600. Then it goes to twelve hundred dollars, but I don't understand why they keep doing that. Because if the fool can't pay the first two hundred, what makes you think he can pay six hundred? What makes you think he can pay twelve hundred? You're charging him more money when he can't even pay the initial few hundred, you know. And that's the way they do it, you know. So I get the kite and I hoop it. I take it back to where I'm at, where I'm housed at. I open it up, and more or less, it's orders from headquarters how to handle some business, you know what I mean? And where I'm going, wherever I end up, they're letting me know, hey, no one's there, get it, grab it, sew it up, get back at us. And that's, you know, a yard. So this is my first term. I really don't want to get involved in a lot of shit, but I mean, just because of where I'm from and because of what I'm related to, a lot of the bullshit just follows me. It just surrounds me. I mean, there's dudes that know who my uncle is or who my cousin is, and they come and ask me for advice and want me to give them the permission to do this. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna give you any permission to do shit, because when it comes down to it, you're gonna put my fucking name in there and I'm not gonna answer for bullshit. You know, I could speak of values about certain things here and I will speak of values, but I always keep names and shit out to protect the innocent. But I'm not here to tell anybody. I'm not here to give a vital information. I'm just here expressing things that I have been through, things that I've been through life, places I have been, where I've gone. And what hits me up in my head and tells me the worst place I've ever been. And I've been to 15 different prisons. I've been to the hall, I've been to the show, I've been everywhere. But the worst place I've ever been was the LA County Gang Wardrobe. And I've been a lot of places. I've been in a lot of situations. But when I hit the LA County Gang Wardrobe for the first time, I remember exactly what happened. We got caught for a riot, they took us all downstairs, they fucking filled out whatever paperwork and then they lined us up and they took us to the tier we're gonna be on. Now as we're walking, I'm in the front because I was the first one they wanted to interview because of my hood and we were real active at then and they wanted to put me in a GMOD so I was the first one they talked to. So I'm in the front of the line. As we cut through what they call the module, we cut through the module, we're going to Able Row, it's all the row on the last on the end on the bottom. Do you know that when we made that left and then we made that little right to get in front of the tiers at the door, that when I made that left and I made that right, when I stepped up to that door, I felt, I don't know if it was a gush of air or something, but I felt something hit my chest so hard that I hit the two dudes behind me. And the dude behind me, the dude behind the guy I was behind said, what the fuck? What the fuck was that? I didn't know what it was. I still today don't know what it was. All I can do is give it, uh, 
just a name and, and try to explain the best I can on what it was. Me, I think it was straight death. That's what I think. Because when I got on that, when I got on that chair and did what I had to do and everybody else did what they had to do, I knew by that, I knew right after that, that that's what that really was. And like I said, I've been to a lot of places. I've been to a lot of prisons, you know, blood alley, all these fucking spots. But never ever have I felt such tension, such anger, such hate, hostility in one place. When that thing hit me in my chest, it didn't feel cold, it didn't feel hot, it just felt plain nasty. A feeling inside my body where I, I understand after I figured out I knew it was death that I felt. But I'm honestly, it hit me so hard that it knocked me into two individuals. I never ever, that were lined up behind me, I never ever felt nothing like that. But I knew once I got on that chair, once I got on that chair, five minutes later, I was stabbing somebody. Five minutes later, I was stabbing somebody. And I only had been on that chair for five minutes. I didn't even get a chance to put my shit down because of the fact that when you get there, they put you all in one cell and you're all packed in there with about seven dudes. And they all got big ass knives on them. Now what they're doing is they get your name, your booking number, and they send it to the streets. On the streets, they call the county, get all the information, give it back to the person that we call again, and all the information comes back. But mind you, during this time that that information is going back and forth, you can't put your shit down. You can't sit on over your bed. You gotta stand there and wait all that time for that to come back. Due to the simple fact that if one comes back wrong, he's getting handled on the spot. You know what I'm saying? And you know, you're sitting there and you're waiting and dudes, they're like vultures. They're like piranhas circling the tank, you know? They're hoping that somebody's shit's gonna come back dirty. I know where my shit is because to the fact that when they're about to run my shit, now they're already handing me the phone. So I get on the phone, I talk to her, I talk to her. So I put my shit down, you know what I mean? I, I, was, I was already to the point where I had already known people, I already put in work, I already did my thing. So they don't have to run my name in black and white. I'm just telling them, whoever you're on the phone with, tell them, you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure they know who I am. And that's what happened. Yeah, they told somebody that I was there. And they say, hey, I want to talk to you. Man, here we go. Here we go. You got there, you got at me, hey, did you do this, do that, do this. And I was like, all right, cool. So about 20 minutes later, they tell me that somebody has to get handled. So you know, that means somebody has to get stabbed. So they tell me, you know, can you do this and have the door unlocked and, you know, past this, but yeah. First day I'm there, I'm already on the chair. They cleared my name. The other dudes, excuse me, are still in that room waiting for their name to get cleared. Sometimes it takes hours. Excuse me, and sometimes it takes hours. Last time it took a whole day. The dudes didn't even sleep who they were waiting on information to come back. Cause you're not allowed to put your shit down and relax because we don't know who you are, what you're busted for. We're waiting for it to come back from the streets. Like I said, and if it comes back all bad, you're through with money. They're gonna kill you on that chair. They're gonna do what they have to do with you, and they're gonna take as much time as they need because of the simple fact that that's all we have is time in there. Time is so time is so good, but yet time is so evil. You know, because there was a guy where I was at in that gang module, and dudes used to come for situations that happened out there with them on the line because we're slammed down. Okay, a dude would get there. And I picked this up along the way. I watched how this guy did it. What he did was the dude would get there and he has to yell on the chair what he wants to talk to him about. He's like, hey, we'll call this dude Jojo. He's like, hey, Jojo, can you tell me on paper what happened out there with you? So Jojo gets the paper, they send him a pen and paper. He writes it all down. Dude gets it, reads it lets me read it, and then folds it up and puts it away. So Jojo's like, hey, what's up? He's like, oh, I got that, it's a touchdown, don't worry about it, and he got it. Jojo waits a whole week, never says nothing about it. The next week, exactly a week later, he's like, hey, Jojo. He's like, yeah, hey, uh, 
Remember what you wrote down the other day? Man, they hit the pad, I had to get rid of it, bro. Can you write it down again? Yeah. So he wrote it down again. So we waited. Now mind you, we're in the back, we're not going anywhere, everybody's stuck right there. So he's being all patient. About a month later, he said he has it quiet on the chair. I need to talk to somebody. So everybody gets quiet and chill. You can't make no noise. You make a noise, you get your fucking ass smashed. But you can listen to what's going on all you want. So he calls Jojo. Hey, Jojo. Yeah, what's up? Hey, go ahead and tell me in your own words what happened out there. And he tells me, Johnny, we're in the same cell. He wants me to get where he's at. What he does is he puts the two papers down side by side, the one Jojo wrote in the beginning and in the middle. Now we're gonna hear Jojo's story. And he tells me, what you up, Jojo? He says, hey, John, get this paper, get that paper, listen to his story. If anything in his story is not what's right here on paper, he's lying. And I already feel he's lying. So here we go. Jojo starts talking about his story and his story, it's not adding up with what he wrote down. So what the dude did was he used time as his friend. What he did was he had Jojo write it down one time, write it down again, and now he has him telling it. So he's gonna tell a lie. The story is gonna change because it's a lie. He's making it up as he goes along. It's not actual fact. Actual fact is gonna be this paper and this paper and his story are gonna be identical because it actually took place. Now this is what I picked up and I used it along the way when I was in situations and I wanted to know what happened to this dude on the yard. Does he gotta go, could he stay? I'd use that scenario. And it, and it was something that I learned in jail and it was so good that, you know, what made the guy think of something like that? I mean, you, you got a lot of time in jail and you think about a lot of shit, but who would actually think of, okay, I got this dude back here with me for months. I'm gonna tell him to tell me his story three times and if it changes, it's his ass. And Jojo was not there no longer with us. Like a day later, Jojo got, they whacked the fuck out of Jojo because the simple fact that his story didn't add up. You know, it was totally different than what he had written down on paper. So, you know, I share it with you because of the fact that I learned so many things in prison that I brought out here with me and I utilized in a good way. I don't use them in a bad way, the way he used it with Jojo, you know what I mean? Because that was, but he was so patient. And you know, we discussed patient about me being patient. I learned to be patient from these guys in here that were patient men, you know, because they're very patient. And to say patient, you know, being patient, that's a virtue, you know, it's a good thing. And it is, you know, but there's certain things that you can't be patient with. You know, there's certain times when if you be patient with this guy, he's gonna take more advantage of you. You know, and he's not gonna wanna pay you what he owes you, or he's not gonna wanna give you whatever dope you have coming. You know, and, and you know, I, I, I admired prison in a way where prison made me very, very humble. It humbled me in a fashion where, not saying that I wasn't having business. No, I'll always handle business. That's not gonna stop. What I mean by humble is, I learned things in here, I learned things in there in certain scenarios where, in other words, I wouldn't even think of that idea. I wouldn't even phantom the thought of making a man, you know, tell a story a couple of times and catch him in a lie, you know? It, it's so devious in there and they play so many mind games in there that, you know, I see guys just lying, lying and lying. You know, they got another thing in there. Say I go in there and I take something that belongs to me and it's for me. Well, you know, I have to give a third of that. Give it away to someone I don't even know. I don't mind if the cause is right, but I don't like where, yeah, it's going upstairs, but by the time it gets upstairs, it been touched like 15 times. So what I sent up there is not actually getting up there. I might have sent five grams and they only get a half a gram but it touches so many hands as it goes along because it has to reach its destination, you know? But at the same time, you got, you're dealing with dope fiends, thieves, connivers, you know, everything you could think of, bums, 
you know, and so many people are touching that, that you, know, you gotta remember where you're at. You're at where the motherfuckers correct, you know, commit all kinds of crimes. You know, and if you're gonna send somebody to the, to the ground, you know it's liable to get touched. There's dudes that will take that gamble and touch something. But little did they know, you know, these things are wrapped in a certain way where it's wrapped with a green balloon. It came from the streets with a green balloon. They didn't find a green balloon inside jail and rewrap it. So if they get that issue and they open that issue and that green balloon breaks, it's their ass because you can't retie it. It's tied so tight with a little ass knot. If you want to get in it, you have to actually break that. And if that green balloon is broken, somebody touched that issue. You know, so that was something else I learned. You know, they, they do so many things in jail where they do it to a point where they know if something's been touched or somebody's been tampering with shit. You know what I mean? I've seen, I've seen a Bible, a Bible that every third page had nothing but $50 things of heroin inside the Bible. Now this Bible just got handed from the uh, priest to the homie. He handed the Bible with that much dope in every third page. They would iron it so thin that they would actually put it, 10 of them in there and iron, iron shut, super glue the pages together. So when they got the book and they went, because they're just gonna run their finger along it to see if anything would fall out. Nothing's gonna fall out because everything is sewed in the pages. But the best one I ever seen was a dude got a package with some bags of Cheetos. He tells me, hey Johnny, come on. We open the bag of Cheetos, he pours them all on top of a piece of plastic in his bed, and he goes, <laughs> boom. Do you know that they put little yellow straws about that big, packed them with dough, got the Cheetos, another bag of Cheetos, put them in a bowl, crunched them all up, put a little bit of water, then they got the straw, packed it with dough, burned both the ends, and then got the Cheeto and just put the Cheeto together. Remember, a Cheeto doesn't have any shape to it. They're different sizes. They got the Cheeto and they put all the stuff back on each straw. So there was 30 straws inside each bag. There was four bags. Each bag contained 30 straws inside, but you couldn't see the straws until you got the Cheeto and you actually either bit it or took it apart. But that was the best thing. When the dude put the Cheetos down and he grabbed it and he went back and then he went Ch and he showed me the straw. I was like, what the heroin, glass, weed. But the way they did was they made the little straw and then they just put the Cheeto back together, threw it back in the bag, sealed the bag back, shook the bag a little and sent it on its way. Because anything on the ground doesn't get x-rayed, only in the air. You know, so if you say you're sending something you don't want to get tampered with, you send it on the ground. Just two months ago, we received a box in the mail. Not addressed to us, but it was just in the mailbox. So we got it. I sat it on the refrigerator. Didn't touch it for a whole week. Finally, I was like, what the fuck is in this box? Do you know I opened that box, you know what was in there? two ounces of glass and an ounce of heroin. And found it in the mail, found the mail, just found the box on top of a mailbox that was just sitting there. I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna take this box, fuck it. It's been sitting there for three days. Mind you, it was sitting for three days outside, outside. I grabbed it, so, you know, I put it up on there. I didn't think twice of it. But when I opened it, that was, that was, that's what was in there. An ounce of heroin and two ounces of glass. Don't know who it was going to, because I know it had a fake name, but it just happened to come to where our mailbox is at, so I grabbed it, you know? So, what I was getting at was like, you know, being in jail, you, you, you pick up so many traits, you know? Uh, a lighter that just has a flick, that just flicks, no little flame to it, is just as good as a lighter that works, you know? All you do is get some toilet paper, get it, twist it up, leave a little bit of it sticking out, get some uh, lint from your sock, Put it on top of that toilet paper, get the lighter, turn it upside down, scrape it to where a little flint falls on that lint, and then you just flick it and whoosh, it ignites. You know, that's just the way to get fire. You know, another one is there's a light socket. 
get two pieces of lead. You need three pieces of lead. You get two pieces of lead and you stick them inside the socket, each socket. Then you get another piece of lead, get a toilet paper, fold it over, twist the lead to where the lead's sticking out. You got the toilet paper and you tap it and it explodes with another piece of toilet paper you have on the side. It explodes, it explodes, and then it lights this toilet paper and you have a light. Now, I, before I would not stick any lead inside an outlet, but because we're in a place where we actually need the light, I have to stick the lead inside the fucking outlet. Because nine times out of 10, I'm the one out there working on the tier because I want to know what's going on in my house. So I'm the one working on the tier. You know, I've popped that, like I've popped that socket so many times where I took the power out in half of the building one time. And that shit must have blew up and, and uh, leads got shot like bullets. They hit the walls like, it just, it just blew up too big. I, I went to hit it and it blew up and fire came out and it just blew those leads and it shot the leads everywhere. Boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? But I'm saying, you know, you learn so many things in jail, how to do things, how to make shit. You know, and then so many dudes are, are telling you, you know, how to cook dope, you know, how to sell dope, what not to do the next time you get out. You know, they, they, they run you down so much shit that I think in there you get out more of a devious person. You get out with more vital information. You know what I mean? You, it, it makes you, it made me a very cautious individual. You know, I'm very cautious with what I do. You know, I, I've, I've did so many things in jail and got away with them to where I've been to places where dudes are like, how in the fuck ain't you back here yet with us? I just plan my shit out. You know, I, I, I go plan A, plan B, and plan C, you know? If you're gonna stab a dude on a yard, you know, you, you have to have some getaway plan. You know what I mean? Because you're on a yard and there's all kinds of people. You have to have some, you have to have an extra set of clothes. You know, you, you have to think of it so good to get away with it. My only thing was to get away with it, get away with it. I did things and got away with it because I just didn't jump the gun. I, I'm not that individual that wants to go earn all kinds of points and stab a dude right under the gun tower. Nah, I'd rather be the guy jogging around the track and on the third lap run by and just stick it in his neck and just keep running. And then run the handball court and take those clothes off, put the feet out and start playing handball. By the time they hit the buzzer and get this dude, I'm already done sweating playing handball. Gang people see me playing handball. And I did it within the nick of time. Within the nick of time. I hit a motherfucker and stepped out of my clothes right into some other clothes. And got away with it. I got away with so much shit. But like I was saying, you know, it, 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 it's a trip because jail makes you a whole different type of man, a whole different type of individual. You see it all there. You hear every lie, you see every story happen over and over and over and over again. And people think, oh man, ask Johnny, he knows what time it is. No, Johnny has just seen the same scenario that you're in right now happen with, with just different individuals. But the same thing happened. Now, the way I'm going to do it is, okay, now I want to handle the situation. Okay, I can do it this way, but damn, last time they did it that way, it ended up all bad. Or I can do it this way the way I've seen it in all these times and everything just came out good. So they'll come with a problem, I'll give them the answer. Then they'll go back and say, how did you know? Because I've seen the same scenario happen over and over and over again, but just different individuals, just different men. The only thing different is every man acts, reaction is different. You know, you got dudes that you can pump up and they'll go handle business. But as soon as they're done handling business, they deflate and become that weak individual that they were in the beginning. You just pumped them up and gave them a little bit of, you know, yeah, I could do it. And after they do it, they're no good to you anymore. They're what you call expandable. You become expandable. You become, yeah, it's expandable. Yeah, you become expandable. You know, you, we don't need you, we'll just get rid of you because there's like 50 more motherfuckers that'll be in line. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, us being Southsiders, we never run short in jail. If they move 50 of us off the yard, they go 50 more back on. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I want to share that with you today about things I learned in jail, you know? And, you know, and, and, and I share them with you due to the fact that these are things I learned and they take me through life now. I use them out here, but I use them mainly in a positive manner. Some I still got to use negative because there are some dudes out here that need a thorough ass whooping. You know what I mean, Mark? I got you, Mark, anytime, brother, you know? Like I said.